Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Brooklyn Historical Society's Bite Size History Lunch with the BHS Collections. For the next four weeks, every Friday at lunchtime, we'll spend a little bit of time digging into one object in our collection, uncovering the many stories a single item um, can tell us and their connection to life and history in Brooklyn and Long Island. I'm Nayeli Guillen. I'm a historian and project manager of the Revealing Long Island History Project here at BHS. We want to thank the Robert D.L. Gardner Foundation, whose generous support of this project um, is making Bite Size History possible. This week, we're taking a look at one of the many local portraits um, in the BHS collection, this one of the late 19th century eccentric, Bloodgood Haviland Cutter. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Linda Ferber, Director Emerita and Senior Art Historian from the New York Historical Society. Hey there, Linda, are you here with me? My voice is here with you at any rate, and I'm delighted to be joining you. <laughs> Start my For all of you yet. that are with okay. us. One moment. The Zoom's, uh, Zoom technology, there you are. Zoom technology may be in and out with us, but we'll be here with you. Um, throughout this episode, Linda is going to provide us with insights into the larger BHS art collections, of which she is a leading expert. In addition to the process of rediscovering the works of female artists and the appeal of beautiful Long Island to those artists. Um, so glad to have you here with you, uh, to have you here with me today, Linda. Um, to just a reminder here. to all of you that are with us, so glad you're here. Um, should inspiration or curiosity strike you throughout the program, we invite all of you listening to share your questions with us. Just type them into the Q&A box that you can see below. Um, and after we wrap up, Linda and I will take as many questions as we can. Ready? Should we get going? Um, great. Um, well, can I please have our first slide up? There he is. Um, I'm pleased to digitally introduce all of you to Bloodgood Haviland Cutter. I'll admit Bloodgood's unique name was what first caught my attention. I can certainly relate to um, the experience of having a quirky name. Uh, but the more I learned about him, the more I became intrigued by him. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the man himself, Bloodgood was born in 1817 to marry Bloodgood Haviland Cutter. Bloodgood was her family's maiden name. Um, or family name. He grew up in Northern Long Island in a region of Queens just off of Little Neck Bay. And I can show you exactly where that is. Um, if we can run to the next slide, please. For non-locals, um, if you're not super familiar with Long Island, um, Brooklyn and Queens are on the far west end. Um, so the little circle is um, Great Neck, Little Neck, which is just off to the east. Um, for those of you who are locals, um, you probably already know that Little Neck Bay is wedged right in between uh, Jamaica, Queens, and then North Hempstead on the Nassau County side. Um, can we go to the next slide? Because Bloodgood descended from two old landed um, Queens families, the Bloodgoods and the Havilands, he lived a relatively comfortable life. He theoretically at one point did work as a potato farmer um, and mill owner, um, but he inherited fortune and significant land holdings from his grandfather, Roe Haviland, allowing him to live the life of a gentleman, right? He didn't have to spend his day to day in a nine to five job. Bloodgood might have passed um, into relative obscurity had he not come into contact with and made a big impression on one of America's great 19th century authors. Um, can we go to the next slide? Quick story. Um, in 1867, Bloodgood was a passenger on the Quaker City Excursion, uh, which was a five month tourist cruise that left New York City to explore the Mediterranean um, and the Holy Land. You can see the Quaker City steamership there in the painting. For those who could afford it in the mid 1800s, um, traveling abroad was incredibly fashionable. Um, and the 75 people who, um, along with uh, Bloodgood, went on the Quaker City trip certainly paid for the experience. Um, it was an expensive trip. It cost um, $1,250 in 1867, uh, but it was five months and it took them um, around the world where they visited cities and sites um, in Gibraltar, Paris, Florence and Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Alexandria, um, and Cairo, among others. A five month trip for any of us would be epic, but the Quaker City trip became known worldwide 
because one of its passengers immortalized the experience for his avid readers. Um, Bo, if you'll click just once. Yeah, um, so you can see I had Blood Goods name highlighted on the list. The name above him, Samuel Clemens, is that writer. Um, Clemens turned his notes from the trip into his first big published hit, the 1869 travel satire, Innocence Abroad, um, which was published under his uh, stage name that we know a bit better than Samuel Clemens, which was Mark Twain. Um, if we can go to the next slide. When picturing Twain, I'm sure I certainly think of the man on the left, slightly older, um, a bit grisly, and I think of his um, later publications, books like um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Um, but in 1867, um, Twain was just 32 years old, um, and he talked his way onto the Quaker City trip by um, offering up his services as a reporter, um, writing for a San Francisco newspaper who paid for the trip for him. Um, during the trip, he wrote travel articles that were published in um, American newspapers describing the cities and the sites around for those who wanted to armchair travel. Um, but he also made observations about his fellow passengers. Um, as you can imagine, after five months together, day in and day out, Twain had some rather pointed opinions about his fellow travelers, particularly Bloodgood. In his notes from the trip, Twain described Bloodgood as, quote, 50 years old and small for his age. He dresses in homespun and is a simple-minded, honest, old-fashioned farmer with a strange proclivity for writing rhymes. He writes them on all possible subjects and gets them printed on slips of paper with his portrait at the head. These he will give to any man that comes along, whether he has anything against him or not. So it's not exactly the most ringing endorsement. Um, and indeed, Bloodgood's habit of expressing himself through spontaneous poetry earned him the reputation as the ship's, quote, poet laureate, um, which was meant by Twain a bit in mocking, but which Bloodgood ran with. Um, throughout the rest of his life, he seems to have really embraced the title um, poet laureate or the Long Island farmer poet. Um, and throughout the rest of his life, he discussed the Quaker City trip as one of the biggest adventures of his life. Um, can we pop to the next slide? To get back to the portrait itself, um, we can see that this time period, the mid 1860s, um, was really a foundational moment in Bloodgood's life. The painting, which on this slide is on the far right, um, is dated 1888, when Bloodgood was actually 71 years old. But um, as you can tell by just looking at the painting, he doesn't really look like an elderly gentleman in the painting. He looks like a man much more in his prime. Um, and one thing that uh, my recent research has revealed was that, in fact, the painting was not um, taken from life in 1888, but was actually based on photographs and engravings um, that he had taken much earlier, right around um, the Quaker City excursion. Um, you can see the photograph on the far left there. That's actually preserved in the Mark Twain papers at UC Berkeley. Um, and, and it's a photograph of Bloodgood um, that was directly used for the engravings that he used in his own book of poetry, which is in the center of the screen. Um, and then again, um, as inspiration for his portrait. Um, it's the exact same look, the exact same man, right? You have those kind of asymmetrical um, hair puffs, um, the same kind of salt and pepper beard. You can even see that his tie in all three um, remains slightly askew, a little bit um, uh, quirky there. Um, so at this point, Linda, I'd like to bring you in. Um, as you know, we've made really great strides in the last couple of years with object research at BHS, Bloodgood's portrait being just one of the more recent exciting examples. Um, I can't stress enough to everyone who's listening how critical Linda has been over the years to our process of learning about the BHS collections, um, both through her work in the 1980s for the Brooklyn Before the Bridge exhibition and recently as part of the Revealing Long Island History Project. Um, so just to start, Linda, can you tell us a bit more about the work you've done with the BHS collections and what you've learned about them over the years? Sure I can. <clears throat> My exhibition in 1982, which took place at the Brooklyn Museum, it was Brooklyn Before the Bridge. It took place at the Brooklyn Museum because there really was a gallery space at the Long Island Historical Society. And it, for me, offered a kind of flyover um, of the collections to select works for that exhibition. But in 2019, when I signed on to the Long Island Reveal Project, I took a deep, deep dive into these amazing collections 
And what is amazing is the interconnectedness of the visual culture collections, which were my province, with the manuscript and library collections. The connections once revealed, and we'll do some of that today, provide threads that offer pathways commenting on a few of these as we move along to give our audience some insights into our process, which was really and is an ongoing adventure. <laughs> um, I'm curious also, Linda, as an art historian, what exactly your impression is of Blood Goods portrait as a work of art, um, especially considering the discover discoveries we've made recently that this painting and several others in our collection are actually the works of little known female artists. Yes, well, I'm happy to consider um, Blood Goods Henderson's Jenny Henderson's portrait of Blood Goods. I think, should we bring the next slide up since we're talking about the painting again and the artist who you see in the um, image on the right? And I'm going to talk about it um, not as a thread into this extraordinary biography, but it, I'm going to talk about it from the context of portrait painting conventions. And of course, I want to announce your super discovery that the artist the lower right, um, was a woman and in fact a member of Blood Goods' household. But is Sarah's portrait of her uncle a work of art? In Japan. Actually, Linda, can I grab you for just a second? Um, can you maybe bring you a little bit closer? Your, the, yeah, your voice is doing. popping is just voice? a bit now. Okay, how's this? Is this better? That's great. Bo mm -hmm. or whomever? Okay. So we're talking about Blood Good's portrait here from the, in the context of portrait painting. And whether Sarah's uh, portrait of her uncle is a quote unquote work of art. And I'm saying that it really depends on who's looking. Institutional protocols differ in historical societies and art museums. At the Brooklyn Historical Society, I'll refer to it as BHS from here on, we find that portrait paintings are more important for who the sitters were and the artists are usually a bit of an afterthought, although they are acknowledged. Now, the opposite holds true in art museums, where the artist comes first. And I encountered these differences in institutional culture when I left the Brooklyn Museum for the New York Historical Society, where, as you may guess, the same hierarchy of importance also privileges the sitter over the artist. So, Sarah's claim, move the next two. Sarah's claim to being a, quote, royal paint artist, unquote, is embedded in this, her only known painting to date. And in fact, her identity as a woman and self-proclaimed artist was only discovered recently um, by Nayeli through census records. No trace of her in exhibition records or dictionary of artists um, has been located. Her modest bust link portrait is based on the photograph or engraving that we saw earlier. She captures her uncle's facial features and is even faithful to his crooked tie. Nevertheless, <laughs> the painting itself demonstrates the limits of her training, if not her abilities. An art museum might well look askance at such a performance, but BHS is, lu is lucky to have this work. While the photograph and the engraving record blood goods features, a portrait painting demonstrates a higher level of social ambition on both the sitter's part and the artist's part. And as Nayeli mentioned, either Bloodgood or Sarah elected to portray him as a younger man than his years, suggesting a measure of healthy vanity. So in other words, the point is, portraits are far from simple records of a sitter's facial features. They carry other narratives. Even the modest bust length format here offers clues to a sitter's social and economic status. For example, the income to commission and to frame a painting and it implies the possession of an establishment in which to hang the painting on the wall. Now, a comparison of Susan Mary Norton's commanding 1891 portrait of Joshua Van Cott, who was the head of the pathology department at Long Island College Hospital, might seem unfair to Bloodgood. But our interest here is in the fact that both paintings are works by women, a fact unknown until the research enabled by the Long Island Revealed Project brought their identities to light. The scale and complexity of Norton's composition also serves to demonstrate the training that enabled her to pursue a career as a professional portrait painter. The artist also took on the challenge, and I love this part of this picture, which I love this picture, on the challenge <laughs> of creating an interior space that suggests the doctor's professional setting 
um, in contrast to the plain dark brown behind Bloodgood. Now, Norton does appear in exhibition records, and a few other paintings are known, but her trail in the literature is still pretty faint. We may ask why. She's clearly very competent. And we'll notice that both artists sign with the first initials only. Now, this is not uncommon. Um, many, many men and women sign with their first initials, but here it might be interpreted as a social signal that the practice was deemed by some to be improper for a woman, that is, being a professional painter. Initials, of course, are gender neutral. And um, so they offered a woman a better shot at being judged by her work rather than being penalized for competing in a man's world. Some women artists, possibly for that reason, kept a pretty low profile. Do we have the next, please? Eleanor. Cunningham Bannister, whose work is on the left, left a much more, much more visible trail as a portrait painter, at least in Brooklyn, where she lived and worked for much of her life. I knew her work from the Brooklyn Museum. The two Bannister portraits we'll look at here each presented particular challenges. And I'll give you some insight into the, the pulling together of threads. Her three-quarter length <laughs> portrait of a soldier in uniform portrays General William Alexander called Lord Sterling a Scottish-American who fought with George Washington at the Battle of Long Island in 1776. Sterling is famous for his command of the holding action at Gowanus Creek that enabled Washington and his troops to escape the British. Around 1850, history painter Alonzo Chapel reimagined the battle itself that you see here on the right as British, British troops pursue a group of American soldiers at Gowanus Creek on August 27th, 1776, one of the earliest engagements in the Revolutionary War. But the battle is known, of course, to many Brooklynites, but has been somewhat unsung in American history until recently, perhaps because Washington's army was defeated and the British would then occupy New York and Long Island for the rest of the war. But back to the painting, I wondered why would Bannister paint a portrait in 1919 that is clearly a copy of or in the manner of an 18th century portrait. It must have been a commission, but from whom? I thought that the provenance or history of the painting could help. That is by what means did this painting come to the Brooklyn Historical Society? And like everything in this adventure, it's not a simple story. But the answer to both questions came only a couple of days ago. And again, Nayeli was the sleuth. An article in the November 25th, 1919 Brooklyn Daily Eagle a font of information, announced the unveiling of this portrait by the Kings County Historical Society, which is now defunct. The painting was introduced draped with the flag under which Sterling had fought for the colonies, and it was to be displayed throughout Brooklyn as part of the society's campaign to gain wider recognition via such paintings um, for, and they also wanted to encourage the erection of um, public monuments to honor this critical military campaign. Now, another more contemporary agenda suddenly popped out at me um, from reading the article about the, the doings of that evening at the Kings County Historical Society. And it's a more contemporary agenda and one that actually should be somewhat familiar to us still. It's one more thread to follow and that is the early 20th century tensions uh, regarding immigration. The speakers that evening in 1919 hoped that the installation of such monuments, and I quote here, with plenty of legible engraving upon them, would show our immigrants and men from foreign lands, the type of manhood of which America is proud. That rhetoric might be slightly familiar, and these are tensions that we know only too well can still surface depending on the economic and other, um, and the political environment. Now, fortunately for this art historian, the article also um, uh, recorded the source of, um, of Bannister's portrait. It's a portrait by Bass Otis, whose work is also at the Brooklyn Historical Society, but this particular portrait is installed in Philadelphia's Independence Hall. Now, that in turn was said to be based on an 18th century portrait by Sterling by the British artist Sir Joshua Reynolds. So our painting has quite a history itself, not to mention a rather distinguished pedigree. The Kings County Historical Society collections came to the then Long Island Historical Society in the 1940s, but this painting somehow did not, and it was gifted to the society more recently. 
Now we're going to look at another banister in a very different mood. Go to the next, please. This is more typical of Bannister's work, and it's a really charming portrait of a little girl in a red dress, and that indeed is how she is identified, a little girl in a red dress. But the Brooklyn Historical, Histor Brooklyn Historical Society historian would immediately ask, who was she? And never mind, would say, the art historian. Here's a painting that could appeal <laughs> purely as a work of art, as a charming example of portrait painting cast in the mode of genre or storytelling painting. This child sits in the corner of a rough stone wall whose massive blocks provide an unusual setting for a sentimental subject, a delicate little girl who gazes upward in mute appeal to the artist and in fact to us as well. Bannister introduces a couple of implied narratives to further enrich this small painting. It's sort of an evocation of childhood. Her basket and red dress might suggest a well-known fairy tale, or she could be a street urchin peddling the contents of the basket although her fine dress and lace collar suggest a much higher social status. Her gaze suggests both appeal and trust, an intimate portrait of a seemingly familiar subject. Once again, her identity may well have been discovered by tracing the donor of the painting, who is a collector of works by Brooklyn artists. He, he included a letter from the original owner of the painting who testified that the work had been painted by her aunt, Eleanor Bannister. This circumstantial evidence strongly suggests that the owner of the painting may also have been the sitter for the painting. And it does indeed have an unusually intimate quality and it is in fact quite small. So we'll wrap up the portraits um, with the fact that although one might assume that portraits simply record the appearance of the sitter, actually, as I hope I've demonstrated here, all portraits carry narratives, some of them like this one, quite poetic. Back to you, Nayeli. Back to the poetry. Could, um, could we go to the next slide, please? I know throughout a lot of the promotion for today's episode, I, I promised to give some um, uh, tastes of, of blood goods, rather colorful, poetic background. Um, and one thing that's really great about the work that we're doing at VHS right now is that we really are finding all of these connections across our collections um, that tie together our paintings, um, works, uh, other works of art, manuscripts, um, and one great thing that's come about is that Bloodgood actually left a very <laughs> healthy trail um, behind when it came to his poetry. We can really find it just about anywhere. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Twain claimed that Bloodgood would uh, print his poetry um, on little slips of paper with um, his picture at the top. You can see one of those broadsides right here in the center. Um, a lot of his works appeared in newspaper articles and in popular magazines, um, really bolstering his reputation. Um, and he even published his own book of poetry in 1886. Uh, and the image that you see on the left side of the screen is actually um, BHS's, then the Long Island Historical Society's own copy of this book that he actually gave to us. Um, these little moments when things kind of come out of the woodwork for us are incredibly exciting. I just about lost my mind when my um, colleague Cecily uh, noted that we actually had this and that it was actually from him. Uh, and he really did blood good. He wrote just about anything. Um, he wrote about friends and family, about everyday life, weddings, birthdays. Um, there's a poem he wrote about ladies' hats um, that were blocking his view at church. Um, and as I was trying to find uh, um, some of his lines to, uh, to share with you guys today, um, I noticed one that I just couldn't quite ignore uh, because of you know the world that we're living in right at this moment. Um, the newspaper article that you see on the right side of the screen here records a couple of his lines that he wrote in 1867, actually during the Quaker City excursion, um, when the, uh, the ship was getting close to um, Naples, which at the time was under a full quarantine because they were experiencing a cholera outbreak at the time. Um, and as you can see, he wrote, uh, to quarantine a healthy ship on an excursion pleasure trip may seem to you all right, but I can't see it in that light. Um, Bloodgood always had a bit of a sing-songy quality to his poetry. Um, uh, but one thing I've noticed, particularly in going through his, um, his own book of poetry, is that he wrote a fair amount about his hometown, about his home island, about Long Island. Um, for example, there's one passage where he wrote, um, there we have the great seashore, there we can hear the billows roar, there we can breathe the pure sea air and can enjoy sea bathing there. 
In many countries I have been, many great places I have seen, yet for all that and what did see, Long Island is the place for me, um, which is sweet. Um, and Linda, uh, this got me thinking, you know, Bloodgood may not have been the most um, skilled um, poet <laughs> to come out of Long Island, but he's certainly part of a class of creatives, right? Other writers and, and painters who turned to Long Island when they were looking for inspiration. Um, can you tell us a bit more about um, what it is about Long Island that really drew people who were looking to create out that way? Sure, and I think the best way to do that is to take a quick look um, at a couple of works among the many by artists um, who were indeed inspired by, um, by Long Island as a resonant, we'll call it a cultural landscape. Could I have the next please? And let me know if I'm coming through loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, this is a, a lovely painting of the interior of the, um, the Payne House in East Hampton. And it's a small sketch uh, study painted on the spot by John Mackey Falconer who was a Scottish-born businessman who commuted to New York from Brooklyn. And he was also, as you can see here, a gifted amateur painter and printmaker. And Falconer was fascinated by the colonial survivals, such as this one, in his own growing city of Brooklyn, where urban growth and property development was rapidly depleting the remaining uh, colonial homesteads. And it's interesting that this was happening just as the approaching centennial in 1876 was bringing all of these um, historic sites to the attention of antiquarians, of nativists, and of the general public, all of whom interpreted these sites as icons of early American culture. Anti-modernism, of course, also fed antiquarian interests, especially as real estate development and urban expansion took an increasing toll on early structures. The impulse was powerful in Brooklyn at the far west end of Long Island and of course in um, out east on the island where many early properties still survived. One of the most poignant elements of these early houses and it's often chosen as a subject um, by artists was the hearth. And in East Hampton, Falconer sought out a landmark house then thought to be the former residence of the American actor and dramatist John Howard Payne who is still revered for the lyrics to the ever popular Home Sweet Home. Later generations of tourists, including um, and artists, including Winslow Homer, Child Hassam, sought out these sites as well. It's interesting that Hassam, Moran, Thomas Moran, and William Merritt Chase are among those who built studios and houses in the region. All of these houses were designed to echo earlier colonial architecture. And in fact, as it still is today, a journey to the East End was enjoyed as a form of time travel, back to simpler times, and I put that in quotes, with nostalgic remnants of pre-industrial life, farmsteads, water mills, windmills, and fishing villages. And those are, of course, some of the same um, attractions that lure us to the East End of the island today. Okay, the next, another artist who mined that Long Island load was um, Charles Henry Miller. And like Falconer, he was also a romantic antiquarian, anxious to record historic structures that were giving way to development. And like Cutter, he was born into a wealthy Long Island family and found many of his subjects in the vicinity of Queens Lawn, the family's summer estate in then rural Queens. Miller was admired in his time as the quote, artistic discoverer of the little continent of Long Island. <laughs> The Society's print collection holds Miller's New York and Long Island landscapes. You see the title plate here, and it's a suite of 45 etchings published in 1889 after the artist's own sketches. And this suite is a late entry in a long tradition of what's called picturesque touring literature, evoking, for example, the famous Hudson River portfolio of the 1820s. Now, if we take a look at Miller's title page, we find a dense medley of picturesque motifs. The term picturesque appeals to both the literary and the visual arts. For example, much of Bloodgood's poetry, including what you just heard from Nayeli, um, uh, describing Long Island's beauty is indeed highly picturesque. Here, Miller has combined word and image in the title page in a composite view of Long Island's attractions, distant wheel mill, a water mill by the stream in the foreground, a boat that brought the artist to the site, and an easel complete with a canvas on it, turned away from us so we can't yet see what he's painting, as well as the artist's umbrella folded under the easel, which is always needed when an artist is painting en plein air. Now, the interesting thing is the somewhat zany detail 
of a giant um, pallet suspended on the branch of a tree and bearing the title of the suite of prints. And when the viewer moved on to view the series of handsome etched landscape images, like this one that we see here, and the next please, these publications offered the armchair traveler a vicarious journey to picturesque and historically significant destinations. As important, these images also stimulated local and regional commerce via the tourist industry entry. Freudian, Freudian slip. Mm -hmm. Like Cutter, Miller was an enthusiastic and promoter of Long Island's charms. And the uh, portfolio included an image of view of Cutter's Hill, Cutter's Mill in Great Neck, Long Island. And the Cutter name is today preserved in um, Cutter's Mill Road and Cutter's Mill Park in Great Neck. So uh, Nayeli is going to say a little bit about Cutter's work um, as a developer. Yeah, um, can we go to the last? I'll, um, I'll push us through this last bit um, so we can get to some of your questions if you've got them. Uh, but it's been really you know, fascinating sitting with one object, one painting like this, because it can really, um, yeah, as you can see, take us in all these different directions, right? We learn more about um, the man itself and about his quirks and hobbies and what people thought of him, um, but also about the artist and the art world writ large. Um, and because he was a Long Islander at this very particular moment in the 1800s, we can really see um, that there was a lot going on on the island at the time um, that was really changing it, despite the fact that artists like Bloodgood and Miller were so interested in um, the island for its sort of rural beauty. Um, one thing that I was incredibly surprised by um, in sort of poking around Bloodgood's life was the fact that he was incredibly enthusiastic about the railroads. Um, on Long Island, the railroad system, um, the track started to be laid in the mid 1830s, mostly by private um, uh, companies uh, who needed investors and Bloodgood. Um, is, you know, sitting up on Great Neck and uh, a little too far away from New York to be comfortable in terms of, you know, uh, commuting easily, um, you know, became a full venture capitalist throwing money um, at the railroad lines in hopes of bringing them out to his region and really helping to modernize um, uh, these uh, farther away parts of Long Island. Um, because I love Bloodgood's poetry, I can tell you again, he wrote a poem called The North Side Railroad, um, where he said, come out my friends and now subscribe to build a road on the north side. If each will only do his part, we soon will see the railroad start. Our land will then take such a rise, twill us agreeably surprise. Then if you wish to sell your land, can get the chink right in your hand. So he knew selling land for the railroad had the potential to make money. Um, and then if you desire more ease, can work or play just as you please. Um, and he did indeed do this. If we um, pop to the final slide, we can see in a couple of these maps. On the left, it's a, um, a, a detail from the 1873 Atlas, where you can see that line for the Flushing and uh, Northside Railroad. If you look just underneath that, um, you can see a couple BH cutters. Um, the atlas is indicating who owned land where. Um, and so you can see clearly right here that particular railroad line um, went right through what used to be blood goods property because um, he sold lands to um, that railroad line and made money when the line prospered. Um, and one thing that's I find incredibly funny is that sort of blood goods ambitions um, may have actually even had um, a role in shaping what became greater New York City. Um, you know, for folks who are not uh, locals, um, Greater New York, which is um, the five boroughs, Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx, um, came together as one metropolitan area in 1898. And Nassau County, who's uh, the one county over on Long Island, um, broke away and became its own county in 1899. Um, if you follow that arrow, you see a little chunk um, of land that's cutting into Nassau County um, because New York City wanted to keep um, probably the railroad line and access to Little Neck Bay. That's blood goods property. So um, it makes sense in a way that he later said during his life that he was happy to be a New Yorker um, because his land, um, very kind of greedily so, became the very far edge of, of New York City. 
that's what I've got. So Linda, why don't we um, take a look to see uh -huh. what our um, questions are? It's, I, would, I would say that there is a certain tension between these attitudes, the nostalgic for the past, and, yeah. um, and the fact that all of these tar tourists and artists, as many people do today, made their way out to the East End via the railroad. So yeah, it's always house. the like it's funny. It's it's a very mixed bag, and it's fascinating to sort out the strands, as you say. It's definitely a double-edged sword. As people go looking for that kind of rural, kind of tucked away experience, but the more people yes. go, um, the more that kind of yes. disappears. Um, it's elusive. Okay. Let's see. Um, so, how did you discover that Sarah Henderson was Bloodgood's niece? Um, Ta-da! I. I was, um, so I'm a, I'm a historian, um, so I spend a lot of time in dusty um, uh, census records, and I was poking around trying to find Bloodgood, um, and in the 1890 census, um, I found his name with one other person staying with him at the time, who was Sarah P. Henderson, um, and it listed her as um, his niece, um, and at the very end, as an oil paint artist, so I, I kind of had a little kind of electric shock go through my hair and kind of started looking her up and figured out that um, there was a newspaper uh, clipping on one of the earlier slides that actually showed that in 1888, um, Bloodgood told the newspaper <laughs> that his niece had uh, painted this painting for him and that he loved it. Um, so it was kind of uh, a little bit of an investigation to really um, confirm those details. Um, I see someone, um, someone asked about, um, artists on Long Island and mm -hmm. wondered where they could find out more about them. Sure. And I could just throw out, um, there was a terrific exhibition on, done a number of years ago by Ronald Pisano, alas, who has passed on, but you can probably find the catalog on a sort of secondary market. And it was an exhibition at the Parish Museum on artists on Long Island. And it began with very, with early works and came up, I think at least through the American Impressionists who, um, were habituated the area in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, Brooklyn Before the Bridge, the 1982 catalog that was done um, collaboration by the Long Island Historical Society and the Brooklyn Museum is rare. It's a rare volume, 1982, the exhibition volume, but it's still around. You can, you can find it. And it deals with, with uh, obviously the west end of the island. And then the artists Moran, Hassam, and Chase have been well ex exhibited, and their exhibition catalogs always include works from um, the later periods in their lives when they did have a, a establishments on the island. And they were particularly Chase and Hassam were extremely well known for their portrayals of the Hamptons of um, and of um, of Shinnecock. So there you go. Nice. From the horses, um, mouth, as it were. <laughs> Uh, there's a question about any paintings depicting, I think, Theodore Roosevelt's Sagamore Hill home Sagamore in Hill. Oyster That's Bay. what got me thinking about Ron's. Um, I would say that I can't bring any to mind at this moment, but I would be very surprised if there were not. It was a picturesque place. It was historically resonant, so it had all of the requirements. And probably and I would you, say, can, you can find someone who painted it. Absolutely. Um, for our, at um, Brooklyn Historical, I don't recall us having any paintings, but we do have a rather robust early Brooklyn and Long Island photograph collection. Mm -hmm. um, and because um, that site is associated with, uh, you know, a great man, um, I wouldn't be shocked to um, discover that we may very well have early photographs of Sagamore Hill. If you go to our, um, to our website and go to the, um, photographs uh, search tab. It'll take you to our past perfect online where you can keyword search. Um, and I would, I, you know, it's either, I would imagine it might pop up in either our early Brooklyn and Long Island photographs or maybe in the Arm Brewster um, scrapbooks. He was always um, collecting images of great houses. Um, Speaking of which, someone asked a question about the development of the Gold Coast, the North Shore. Um, I associate that with with late nineteenth century. I associate it in general um, as a, with the gilded, what the so-called gilded age, mm -hmm. and um, certainly it 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 was a catalyst for Americans to imitate uh, the great aristocratic estates, uh, particularly of of Great Britain, um, and to uh, commission great 
portraits by people like John Singer Sargent of themselves. Right. And for, um, for British on their part, as we all know from Downton Abbey, to marry <laughs> wealthy American girls. They were known as the dollar princesses. But um, so I would associate it with the last quarter. Um, Absolutely. Of the yeah, it's sort of free. coming in well into the 20th century. Until um, the Russian, perhaps. The railroads certainly kick it off, but um, with New York and Brooklyn growing over the course of the la last quarter of the 19th century, um, and men like Bloodgood selling off land for um, development, um, it really speeds up in the late 1800s and into the 1900s. Um, oh, God. You're blanking. The Great Gatsby, the house yes, um, that yes. inspired the book is actually out that way on Great Neck. Um, the author lived there for a, a little while, I think in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, it's a, a kind of definitely a Gilded Age point. Um, let's see, what is the Quaker connection? Um, the Havilands um, in Queens certainly are um, kind of long, um, that's not the right way to say it. The Havilands are known um, as, Queens area Quakers um, going back uh, centuries. Uh, that family, um, my mind has shut down. That family dates their living in Queens to the mid 17th century and um, the Quaker connection with them certainly goes back that far as well. I think we have, might have some manuscript material relating to the Havilands in, um, in Queens and certainly um, other families that um, prescribe to that faith as well. Well, um, I'm being told we should wrap it up. Thank you so much for all of your questions. Um, we're out of snacks, so we're gonna call it a cut on uh, this episode of Bite Size History. Um, thank you so much to my special guest today, Dr. Linda Ferber. It was fun. Um, I had so much fun. Uh, and a big shout out from all of us again to the Robert Gardner Foundation for your Absolutely. continued support of the Absolutely. Long Island Project. Uh, before signing off, I want to take a moment to connect the work we're doing at BHS, preserving and researching our historic collections to our new ongoing work building collections, um, particularly those that reflect our present lives. Um, if we can go to the, yeah. Um, some of you may have heard that both we at BHS, along with our friends at the Brooklyn Public Library, are actively seeking items that tell Brooklyn's stories and experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're living through a life-changing historical moment, and like other cultural institutions around the country, it is our hope and our goal to document these times so that future generations can understand how the pandemic impacted our communities. So if you live in Brooklyn, please send your photos, videos, and audio clips, artifacts, masks, um, posters, and other artistic expressions to brooklynhistory.org slash COVID-19 project. Um, or you can contribute your oral history to the Brooklyn Public Library um, at brooklynlibrary.org slash podcast slash oral histories. Um, definitely refer to those links um, for more information on how to donate. And thank you in advance for participating and being part of our Brooklyn community and family. Join us next week um, for the third week of Bite Size History, uh, which will feature one of the oldest and most significant furniture items in our collection, at least in my opinion. Um, the important part, not the old part. Um, the desk box, which was part writing surface, part storage, is over 350 years old and was originally owned by William Wells, who was one of the original English settlers of the town of Southhold on Long Island's East End. For that episode, I'll be joined um, by special guest Lauren Brincat, who is resident curator and a fellow objects enthusiast um, from Preservation Long Island. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.